happy Friday. Hope your week is going well. Um, reminder that the quiz is due on Moodle, 9 p.m. tonight. Um, one uh, other announcement is Monday's class, we will have a guest speaker. Um, and it's not because uh, I don't want to tell you all about minimum spanning trees. There's nothing I would love more. Um, but the computer science department is actually interviewing someone who might teach here, uh, uh, teach classes all through next year. And part of that interview is this person teaches a class. So uh, uh, on, on Monday, you'll probably see some other uh, CS uh, faculty sitting in the back of the room. I will uh, we'll do some some practice and, and you'll have a chance to ask me questions for the first 15-20 uh, minutes of class and then I'll turn things over to uh, the guest speaker. Um, the department is going to be interested in your thoughts on kind of how this how this person did, how class went, so you'll be getting a, a survey from uh, the chair of the CS department, Jeff Ondick, uh, after Monday's class. Um, any questions on on that or um, Kwok? Wait, are they still going to be teaching minimum spanning trees? Are they teaching their own? Uh, no, the, uh, our guest speaker will be teaching you about minimum spanning trees. Uh, so please cut them some slack. Play along. Um, it's not, no, I'm sure, not a, not a, uh, yeah, definitely not an easy situation to just parachute into a, a class you've never met before. Uh, all right, any, any questions to, to get us started on the quiz, lab, uh, lab seven, anything like that? All right, so we have, uh, Double double duty today. Part of why there is no no plickers. Uh, we have uh, a lot to talk about, so I want to jump right in. We've been talking a lot about graphs, uh, and at no point have we talked about uh, how this graph would actually be stored. Like, what sort of data structure would we use to actually represent nodes and edges? So, when we've done it with a tree. We have um, had, a, had a node class, and, and, the, um, and things have uh, kept track of data inside the node and left and right children. Um, and for graphs, we're going to, because uh, there's, not a, there's not a root, and uh, the graph structure is kind of far more, more general than the kind of binary trees that we've been talking about, uh, the data structures will similarly kind of be uh, be less specific to one kind of structure. Um, and there are basically two approaches that people take to uh, storing a graph. So the first one, and indeed uh, the one that I used to implement the undirected graph that uh, is part of the handout for Lab 7, uh, is called an adjacency an adjacency list. Um, oh, one small point that I wanted to pick up on. Uh, when I told you the name for uh, kind of the, the number of things in a set, uh, it's cardinality. I left out the I. So uh, spelling, not my strong suit, but it is spelled with, with one more I than I had originally said. All right, that just... Wanted to, to mention that. Okay, back to adjacency list. Um, so we're going to <coughs> we're going to assign each node an index, um, uh, like an index and an array. Uh, so if we're assigning nodes like array indexes, what is the the range of of those numbers? Like where what 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 where would we start? Yeah, it would be like zero up to you know size of the minus one. Are are those indexes? Um, and 
the way that this is going to work is we have, say, we'll do a directed graph. Have some node A and a node B and C and D and put some edges in here. And then I'll do my assignment of numbers. I'm going to say A index 0, B index 1, C index 2, D index 3. And my data structure, as this name suggests, is going to be a list or an array, something with, with indexes. 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And then this other part of the name, adjacency, any guesses in as to what we're going to keep track of in these spots? Paul? Yeah, we're going to keep track of kind of what is adjacent to what really, we're going to keep track of the edges. I was like, we have a spot for each node, but we need some way to keep track of the edges. And so each of these uh, spots in our array here are going to be uh, a linked list of the nodes that that node is adjacent to. So I can look at A here and kind of what, uh, uh, what are the outgoing edges uh, for A? Brian? Uh, to B. Yeah, just this one to B. And so we would have just, uh, we'd say the first node in our linked list has, uh, it is adjacent to kind of the node at index one. And it's kind of next pointer would be, would be null. It was kind of, we have one node in our, our linked list and it says node zero is adjacent to node one. We look at, at, uh, at B, how many of outgoing edges does it have? Yep, just one. And we say it is adjacent to node zero. Node two, C, that's adjacent to both B and D. And so there is no particular order. The edge to B could come first, the edge to D to come first, that doesn't matter. Um, but we would say, okay, it's adjacent to three, which is node D, um, and also adjacent to uh, B. So this linked list records that uh, our node C adjacent to D and B as far as the outgoing edges go. Uh, would there be uh, any nodes in our linked list for index 3? Yeah, I see some folks shaking your head. There uh, would not. That could just be null because uh, there are no outgoing edges from D. And this is the entire information in terms of uh, capturing what nodes we have and what edges exist in the graph. What are your questions on this? Make sense? All right, let's do a bit of analysis of how this is going to perform. Uh, we're going to want to know the, the following things. So the efficiency of Uh, what if we have? A, what if we want to get all the outgoing edges of some vertex? Kind of how much work would that take? Uh, if we want to get all incoming edges to some vertex, where 
where we might want to check does an edge exist in this graph. Uh, that's an operation that um, will be, be important for, for lab seven. We want to insert an edge and delete an edge uh, and also think about how much space kind of how much of the computer's memory uh, is taken up to represent our graph this way. So let's, uh, let's walk through uh, these things. Um, so to get all the outgoing edges, we have some vertex. Uh, uh, we know what its index is. What would we need to do in order to get to find out what are all the nodes that uh, uh, node V connects to? Or, yeah, what are all the vertexes that, that vertex V connects to? Surfing? You just go down its linked list. Yeah, we have to kind of go through each thing in its linked list. Um, and so if we say, Uh, if we say D is going to represent the out degree of some vertex, um, where the degree of a vertex is how many edges are connected to it, out degree is the number of outgoing edges. Uh, and so we'd have to go through kind of all D of our outgoing edges uh, in order to get all of this. How about getting all the incoming edges? So again, I say I have a vertex V, and I want to know what are all the incoming edges to V. Uh, anyone have a suggestion for how I could use an adjacency list to get that information? Elena? Go through all the indices and then track all the Exactly. We go through each vertex and we kind of check its linked list to see does this vertex connect to the to the node we're, we're looking for. Um, so we would essentially need to check every single edge in our graph in order to determine which ones are coming coming into our our node. We could keep two separate adjacency lists around, kind of one like this that keeps track of outgoing edges, and then another one that separately keeps track of ingoing, uh, incoming edges. Uh, and so then we wouldn't have to look through all edges, but that would use that would use twice as much space. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? All right, let's look at the rest of these. Uh, to check if an edge exists, what would we do? Uh, if I want to know, is there an edge between node, node A and node B? What would, I, what would I do with my adjacency list? Brian? Check if a link list exists in the adjacency list. Yeah, I would, I would go to the link list for the sort of start of the edge and then look through all the nodes there and see if any of them are the sort of destination I'm looking for. So uh, if, is, there a node, is there an edge between 0 and 3? I would go to 0 and look through its linked list to see if any of those said 3. And if none of them did, you know, the edge doesn't exist. If I do find 3, then that edge does exist. Uh, and so this is, again, going to be searching through a linked list of, of with D kind of things in it, where D is the, the out degree of uh, the, the source of our, of our edge. How about inserting an edge? How would I, if I want to say, uh, insert the edge, um, Let's say C to A. What would I do 
uh, to my adjacency list. Jeffrey? You go to the um, correct index of C and then add A to the link list. Uh, yep, I would add a, a new node to the link list. Uh, where would be a good place to, to add a new node to, to the link list? Jeffrey? To the tail, since before you said that the, in the order of like, the link list doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so if it's a singly linked list, I'd have to go all the way through it to get to the tail. Um, but if I had a separate sort of arrow to the tail, I could jump right there. Um, but we could certainly insert it just at the at the beginning. Um, what is our our big O running time for inserting a, a node at the start of a linked list? Yeah, it's, that's going to be kind of constant time to add a new edge. We just kind of jump to a linked list, insert a new node right at the front. Uh, deleting an edge, say I changed my mind, I've, I've added uh, added my, my new edge to, to my graph and I want to delete it now. Uh, how could I go about deleting it? Run. Uh, go to the index of the node that it's connected to and search through the linked list of all the edges. Exactly. I again have to just like look through the linked list to, to find the edge that I'm trying to delete. So this is going to be another one of our look through D, D nodes uh, in a linked list. All right, last but not least, let's think about how much space this is going to take. Uh, and for space, let's imagine that kind of each box that I've drawn up here uh, is sort of one unit of, of space. Like each, each box I've drawn up here is an object, and so kind of the objects are all roughly the same size. Uh, and so how many kind of separate objects uh, uh, do we have? Um, thinking in terms of kind of the size of this graph. When we've talked about the size of the graph, like how many things are, are in it, um, what are, how, how have we expressed that? Paul? Sparse sort of dense. Sparse or, or, or dense, those are kind of two types of graphs. But if we all kind of wanted to write down a mathematical expression of like how big a particular graph is. Jake? Uh, well, we just have like the set of vertices with the set of edges. Yes, exactly. That we're going to need sort of one spot in our list for each vertex and then one node in a link list for each edge. So kind of the number of vertexes plus the number of edges are kind of the number of separate separate spots that we're going to need. So that's size of V plus size of E, because that's how we write down kind of how many vertexes, how many edges, kind of how big uh, a graph we're dealing with. Does that make sense? All right. So we done our, our adjacency list analysis. So we're going to look at the, the alternative. Uh, I, yeah, so we'll, we'll look at the alternative and then we'll, we'll think about what sort of graph we, or what sort of data structure we'd want to use when. So we're again going to be recording information about adjacency, but this time in a matrix rather than a list. So we're going to have our, our same, uh, I'll draw it again, same A, B, C, D graph. And we're again going to assign each of our nodes a number, an index. Uh, but in this case, we're going to, uh, rather than a list, have a matrix and 
and each entry in this matrix is just going to be true or false, indicating is there an edge from, uh, in this case, we'll say um, uh, the, yeah, so we'll say that um, this side is the source. And this side is the destination of the edge. Um, so there are no kind of self edges. There's no edges between 0 and 0, 1 and 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3. So these would all be false. Uh, and then I'm going to go through, OK, nodes, uh, edges that start at 0, kind of which, which uh, well, though, which, which entries here will be true? Yeah, just the entry at 1, because that's our edge to B. Uh, B goes uh, back to 0, but doesn't, go, doesn't have an edge to anywhere else. Uh, our node C, so starting at 2, uh, it, ha it goes to B and goes to D, and then D no edges going anywhere. So we have our, our adjacency list, adjacency matrix, uh, and uh, we're going to kind of go through these same operations and think about what is the efficiency of our adjacency matrix. So I'd like you to uh, take a few minutes, work with your neighbors, kind of fill in uh, the efficiency of each of these uh, for our adjacency matrix, rather, uh, uh, so we can compare it to our adjacency list. I should mention, uh, you can think of this matrix as a, like, uh, uh, an array of arrays. So you can, uh, you can like, jump to any index uh, within, within here. All right. Let's talk about uh, our adjacency matrix efficiency. Um, so, if we're getting all the outgoing edges, uh, what would we what would we need to do to find that out in our matrix? Paul, you just add the smallest sources. Of yeah, we like need to go um, kind of across a whole row of of our matrix. Uh, how many things are in a row of this matrix? Yeah, uh, no, however many vertexes we have, that's sort of the dimension of our matrix. So we can think of this as having size of v things, and this as having size of v things. So getting all the out edges, big O, size of B. How about all the in edges? What would we do to find that in our matrix? Luke? We just did in the column instead. Exactly. The row tells us outgoing for two, column tells us incoming. For, for that same thing, and the column is also has size of things in it. Uh, checking if an edge exists. Jeffrey? We constant. Yeah, we just can go to a single spot in our matrix, and since these are arrays, we can jump to an index in an array in constant time. Uh, so we can check uh, if an edge exists. Very, uh, very efficiently. How about inserting an edge? Constant. Yeah, constant. Why would it be constant? You can just change it to true or false. Yeah, again, we jump to a spot, change it from, from true to false, so we're going to have constant time for insert and constant time for delete, because it's just changing it uh, uh, one way or the other. Uh, and finally, how much space is our matrix going to, to take up. Jeffrey? 
Jeffrey? The V squared. Why V squared? Because each column is like the number of vertices, and then each row is also. Yeah, we're just looking at the sort of the number of, of boxes in our in our matrix here. We have V times V, so that gives us V squared. All right, so now we have the rundown of our adjacency list, adjacency matrix. So let's think about when would we want to use one over the other. And one way to think about this is to think about the two kinds of graphs um, that we, we've talked about. Uh, we've seen sparse graphs and dense graphs. So if we had a sparse graph, uh, would we want an a, a adjacency matrix or an adjacency list? Christopher? Uh, list. Why, why a list? Um, just because um, it has less yeah, yeah, that's exactly the, the right way to think about it. That our, our matrix, whether or not an edge exists, it has a spot for every single possible one. Uh, and so, uh, and it really comes down to the space that an adjacency list, if edges are similar to the number of vertices, which is what we would expect for a sparse graph, this space is a lot smaller uh, than, than v squared. We have two times v versus v squared. Um, so sparse, we're typically going to have an adjacency list because it's going to be a lot less space. Uh, and it, looking through all the edges likely won't be that bad because, again, we just don't have that many edges in a sparse graph. Uh, how about dense? Why? What would we want for for a dense graph, and why? Surfing. My guess is a adjacency matrix, and that's mainly because. The I guess the constant running time complexity for like just the inserting and the leading edges is what you want the most. Yeah, that our our adjacent uh, our dense graph, lots and lots of edges, uh, and so we in fact we get almost no space savings compared to just having a spot for every single edge because dense was saying like most of the edges are there in a dense graph. Um, and then we have some instances where we won't have to potentially be looking through a very long linked list if there are lots of outgoing uh, uh, edges from, from nodes. So this is typically how it breaks down, adjacency list for sparse, uh, adjacency matrix uh, for dense graphs. What are your questions on that? All right, excellent. So we know how to store graphs. Um, and uh, another thing we need to know about is Franklin Roosevelt, um, 32nd president of the United States. There's a, a picture of, uh, of him uh, late, late in his, his presidency, 1944. Uh, you may remember that he um, kind of came uh, uh, trounced Hoover in, in 1932, kind of came in and the, and the country was in crisis, like 20% unemployment, tens of millions of people without work, um, uh, times times really bad, and he came in with this attitude of like, uh, the government is just going to try stuff, and we're going to see if it works, and if it doesn't work, we're going to admit it, and then try something else. Um, and... Uh, he uh, created a lot of a, a lot of programs that kind of empowered workers or uh, government programs that hired people to do things like um, uh, uh, make trails, um, uh, do conservation, 
Uh, there are a lot of kind of murals and other art that were created by uh, people employed by the government during, during this period. Uh, and this sort of set of programs got called the New Deal, kind of a New Deal for America, uh, which uh, leads to this excellent solitaire uh, meme. Um, Roosevelt likes, likes the New Deal. Um, another uh, interesting fact about Roosevelt is, is he f basically followed the exact same career path as his distant cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Franklin Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Theodore Roosevelt was Governor of New York. Franklin Roosevelt was Governor of New York. Uh, they both ran for Vice President, um, uh, and they were uh, kind of, uh, Franklin Roosevelt took a lot of the kind of progressive policies that uh, his cousin had, had proposed when he, he ran as the, as the Bull Moose Party. Um, something that I find very entertaining about Roosevelt is kind of uh, the way that he, he went about campaigning, particularly in, in 1936. He had kind of started all these, these new programs, um, a, lot of, and he, a lot of which were, were popular, and his opponents were um, uh, trying to, to convince the public that, uh, that they would better manage these policies than Roosevelt. Uh, and so he, he, he had this to, to, to make fun of them. warn you. And let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course, we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. Uh, he he also um, framed himself as kind of the uh, uh, as being um, uh, the 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 enemy of kind of uh, big business and kind of all all the the the, the wealthy people that that wanted to to keep everything for themselves uh, and he had this this famous line in a, in a speech where he's just kind of explained that uh, all these. Um, all, all, all these kind of big business and, and wealthy interests are, are arrayed against him. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. That line got quite caused quite a stir at the time uh, having a president saying he welcomed the hatred of of uh, his political opponents um he went on to uh do pretty well in that election uh and the next one and the one after that um and uh by this last one in 1944 it was um in the middle of of world war ii uh and uh he had been been president for more than than twelve years, which had certainly taken uh, taken a toll, and he he died uh, of a stroke shortly after um, being being elected for his fourth term. Um, and uh, uh, a few years after that, people in Congress decided that they didn't really like that presidents could technically be elected over and over and over. Uh, and so it was only after um, Franklin Roosevelt that the U.S. Constitution was amended to actually prevent. Uh, anyone from being president more for more than two terms. All right, so that's that's our our presidential facts. Okay. So, with our remaining time, uh, I want to to turn to the problem of uh, given a graph, say. Uh, uh, a set of like roads and destinations, or a set of flights, or um, uh, um, 
or, or even uh, routing uh, internet traffic around the world. Uh, we have a graph where uh, it's weighted. We have kind of distances or costs or kind of some sort of, of uh, value associated with each edge, and we want to find uh, the shortest the shortest path. So we saw last time. that we had an algorithm that could find shortest paths on an unweighted graph. Does anyone remember which algorithm that was? Luke? Was it the breadth first search? Exactly, that our breadth first search because it kind of searched uh, uh, kind of everything within distance one before everything with two edges away and then everything three edges away, it would kind of find uh, the, the path with the fewest edges from some starting vertex to actually all other, other vertexes. Uh, so we had our breadth first search. Uh, uh, could find, given some starting point, could find the shortest path to every other uh, node in the graph, an unweighted graph in big O of, of size of V plus size of V. And we, our breadth first search, kind of went through every, every node once and kind of every edge coming out of every node once, uh, which is kind of where this, this efficiency came from. So why doesn't breadth first search work on a on a weighted graph? Could it recommend the path that is on the first level while the weights of the path that has five levels is a lot twice? Exactly. The the path with the fewest edges is not necessarily the path with the lowest weight if we add up the weights of all the edges. Um, and have a Uh, a simple example, breadth first search is going to say, hey, I found the shortest path. Uh, it's weight uh, 1 million uh, because it's one edge instead of the two edges that would be weight 2. So breadth first search uh, doesn't, doesn't know anything about weights. So we're going to uh, today and, and continuing Monday um, look at uh, how we can deal with this problem uh, of weights. And we're going to have a couple constraints on this problem. Uh, the first is uh, no negative cycles. And so what I mean by this is that uh, If we have a graph like this, this is 5, this is 10, and going down here is negative 100, and going back up is 15, we can see that the, the lowest cost path is do this cycle infinity times. Because each time you kind of get negative, uh, uh, a negative edge uh, 100, it's going to kind of lower the overall cost. So the, even the notion of a shortest path, it just doesn't really make sense when you have a negative cycle. So we're going to assume that that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Elena? What if it's just a negative edge that is the most right Yes, so the, uh, that's, that's a more, uh, maybe a more realistic scenario. We have, we have a negative edge, but, um, but there's not this weird sort of, you can cycle here for free. Um, so there are algorithms that can deal with negative edges. The one that we're going to talk about assumes all edges are positive weight, uh, or are non-negative weight. Um, uh, but there are somewhat slower algorithms than the one we'll talk about that can account for negative edges. All right, so what is the algorithm that we will talk about?
It is called Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, Dijkstra being uh, Edgar Dijkstra, um, uh, a famous computer scientist, uh, uh, Dutch, um, uh, who uh, kind of was uh, did a lot of uh, foundational work in the in the twentieth century. Um, uh, was also very very opinionated. Uh, one of one of his his quotes is: "Computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes." Um, so he was very much like computer science is like thinking about algorithms, and it has like it doesn't mean thinking about computers. I don't share that view, but as I said, Dijkstra. I mean, he's it's way more famous than me, so <laughs> may, maybe you should listen to him. Um, all right. So, what is the idea behind this algorithm? Um, I have one, one kind of intuitive idea is we're going to have some part of the graph that is like the part where we know the shortest paths and then another part that we have yet to find the shortest paths and we're going to kind of piece by piece add nodes to our sort of kind of region of the graph where we know the shortest paths. Um, and kind of do that a bit at a time, and so by the end, we're going to know the shortest paths sort of everywhere in the graph. Um, the kind of outline is uh, surprisingly, surprisingly simple. So we're going to initialize the cost of the start node, kind of where we're starting our search to zero. All others to infinity. So at the, uh, at the start, to get from the start node to itself, it's already there, cost is zero, but we don't know anything about the others, so we're kind of saying, for all we know, we can't get there. They're infinitely far away. Uh, and then at each step, we are going to pick the closest unknown vertex to the ones that we know so far. We're going to add this vertex to our kind of set of known vertices. Uh, and then uh, yeah, so just to be consistent, I'm going to set of cost to say distance. But just means kind of however kind of the, the sum of all the weights on all the edges to get to, to whatever that node is. So uh, I'm going to update the distance with edges from this node V that we just added to our node set. And kind of this, is the, this is it. This is the entirety of, of how this, this algorithm works. Uh, we're going to repeatedly pick the closest unknown unknown vertex uh, and then kind of update our estimates of how far away our unknown vertexes are from the known ones. And put this in here we go. To put this in slightly more formal terms with some pseudocode, um, this sort of initialization step, we're going to uh, say, okay, for each node v, its cost is infinity, and we don't know it. We we haven't. Uh, it's not part of our our known vertexes, uh, and then. We say the cost of our, our source, kind of the starting point of our search, that's going to be zero. 
Uh, and then while there are unknown nodes in the graph, uh, as I said, we're going to select the node with the lowest cost, uh, which initially clearly going to be kind of the source, because that's zero and everything else is infinity. So we're going to start by selecting uh, that, that initial node. Market is known. Uh, and then here's the real crux of the algorithm. That's the sort of update the distances uh, according to the edges. So what this says is that for each edge going from the node that we just selected, this lowest cost node, to some other node, u, uh, and each of these edges has some weight w on the edge. And we're going to check. Uh, how much, how, what is our current estimate of the cost of getting to you, which remember is going to start at infinity? And what is the cost of it if we first went to V, this node that we just examined, and then added on the weight of this edge? So this is basically saying, what is our current shortest path to this node U? versus what would the shortest path be if we first went to V and then took the edge from V to U. And we compare, is this new cost uh, better than the previous best cost? If so, we kind of update our cost uh, and then record, kind of, okay, so the way that we get to U is from V. That's the shortest, shortest way to U. So before I go through an example, what are your questions on this, this pseudocode? Jake. Uh, for like the welfare unknown nodes in the graph, would it circle back around once it's hit like the end node, or do we like start this without a goal in mind and it just maps out the entire uh, good question. So uh, it turns out for both breadth first search and Dijkstra's, there's not really any difference between finding the shortest path between two specific nodes and finding the shortest path from a start to every other node in the graph. Um, because at least in terms of big O, in the worst case, we might have to check every node in the graph in order to find the shortest path to a specific one. Uh, so the way that this is set up is, okay, we've chosen some start, and we're going to find the shortest path from that start to everything else. All right, let's go through an example. So I have here a weighted graph, weighted directed graph. Uh, that I've initialized that the cost of A is zero, the cost of everything else is infinity or, or question marks as it's shown in this table. Um, and this table here I'm going to use to kind of keep track of the steps of this algorithm. So I'll start out by pick the closest uh, unknown node. That's got to be zero. That's closer than all these infinities. And when I select A and then go through its edges, uh, which rows in this table is that going to update? Yeah, it will go through the neighbors of A and will say, all right, a is now known, and the cost of getting to B can't be more than 2 because we just found a way to get there that costs 2. There can't be a way to get to C that would cost... The, the shortest way to get to C can't cost more than 1 because we know a way to get there that costs 1, and we know a way to get to D for 4, and we record that, okay, A is the previous node on the path, on this shortest path to get to these. And I'm keeping track down here of the order in which these nodes were added to this known set. Uh, this is not something that the algorithm actually needs to keep track of or that matters for its like correctness. It's just kind of, oh, it's going to help us kind of see why this, this works for finding the shortest paths. 
what is the next node uh, that we would uh, process via Dijkstra's algorithm? Charlie? C? Yeah, why C? Um, it's the bit of the lowest cost that we know of. Exactly. So we C's lowest cost, and we process C. We look at its outgoing edge to A. Uh, its outgoing edge said, okay, we could get to A via 1 plus 9 is 10, but we already know how to get to A for 0, because that's where we started. So we don't update A, uh, but we have found a shorter way than infinity to get to E, and it costs 1 to get to C plus 11 to get to E. So it would cost 12 to get to E if we went through C. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that was that step of we add the cost of getting to C plus the weight of the edge that we just found. Uh, next, uh, we do our lowest cost node again. That's B. Uh, what rows of our, our, our table are going to update when we, when we process B? I mean, other, other than, than B's row. Huh? Yeah, uh, there's also an edge to E. Why wouldn't we, we update E? Because that's 12, which we have as the cost, so it's not much that. Exactly. We, we find a, another path to E, but it's not any better than the, than the one we found so far. Uh, so we found a way to F, but otherwise it's unchanged. Um, at this point, we have two nodes that are kind of the closest uh, unknown. And so there's Dijkstra's doesn't specify an order in which we have to process. We could do D then F or F then D. It would be correct either way. Uh, I'll do D first. Uh, there's, no, there's no new uh, paths found there. Uh, we do F and we find a path to H, update that in the table. H is now our closest node, so we now find a path to G. And uh, when we process G next as being closer than E, we actually now find there is this long roundabout path to E that is actually shorter than the one we found initially. So the fact that we were always processing the closest node first meant that we uh, kind of put off visiting E until we were absolutely sure that we couldn't get there through all these all these closer nodes. Um, and so that is sort of an intuition for, for why this works. Um, that'll be uh, where we'll end for today. Uh, so we'll, we'll finish up with uh, Dijkstra's on Monday and then have our guest speaker about minimum spanning trees. Uh, remember to take a look at the quiz and keep working on Lab 7. I will see you Monday.